Welcome back to Quantum Conversations. My name is Sarah, and today my co-host Carrie Bennett and I are going to be making these complex topics of quantum biology and circadian biology understandable to the everyday person. Thank you so much for tuning in. We ask that if you are listening on audio only, that you take a moment to leave us up to a five-star review. And if you're on YouTube, leave us a like, leave us a comment. It will help to get the show out to more people. And before we jump into today's topic, just a quick reminder to head down to the show notes and check out my free resources as well as Carrie's free resources. We also do have courses on a variety of topics. If you are hoping to dive deeper, Carrie and I both have have practitioner courses available as well for anyone who wants to begin to bring these topics to their clients and help them to implement these strategies into their daily lives. So check those out. We also have a co-taught course called Quantum Fertility that is available that allows people and practitioners to work on their fertility using these principles of quantum biology and circadian biology. Again, thank you so much for listening or watching today's show, whichever one you are doing. And let's go ahead and jump into it now. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Quantum Conversations. Today, we're going to talk about food and seasonal <laughs> Seasonal eating. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, it's, dun. it's the topic we get uh, the most questions about, even though like our emphasis is typically light and yeah. mitochondria. Yeah. And, but I think it's important for people to understand our perspective on food for sure. I think so. And then maybe just to make it simple, I know that we had um, Dr. Sarah Pugh on the show really to talk about keto and to talk about deuterium, which we had those episodes that aired in the winter time. So they're a little bit more, you know, like seasonally appropriate, but now we're in the Northern hemisphere. Cause I know we do have some listeners, uh, in Australia, New Zealand, the Southern hemisphere, majority of our listeners, I would say are in the U S uh, but we are starting to shift into spring summer. And so, yeah, let's maybe just talk about how food fits into the circadian lifestyle, right? Yeah, totally. So the reason I, th I think there's a couple of things that we look at from a quantum circadian perspective when it comes to food. And maybe we can, and maybe we can have maybe like a, a, a hierarchy of like mm. what we prioritize. Um, before, first and foremost, actually, before we even get to seasonal circadian, I always say to avoid glyphosate whenever possible, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter if you're eating seasonal and local, but you're just, it's full of glyphosate. Unfortunately, glyphosate in and of itself is a mitochondrial toxin. Mm -hmm. It can impact the connective tissue, our quantum communication superhighway. It can impair the ability of water to hold charge. There's a lot mm -hmm. of things that are, <laughs> it disrupts the gut microbiome, can't make those aromatic amino acids to capture, like, like lots of things, right? And so when at all possible, and I'm not perfect, you're not perfect, right? Mm -hmm. We want to couch this, like I am by no means perfect. I try the best I can to avoid glyphosate. Mm-hmm. Sometimes mm -hmm. it means looking for actual, actual organic certified organic stuff, but that's not the only way that you can avoid glyphosate because so right. many of these small farms also can right. have regenerative, healthy growing practices, but they don't have an official organic label. If mm -hmm. you will. Yes, exactly. Starting there. Yeah. So that's why it's so important to know, you know, when you are getting produce to, to like know where it comes from. Um, and I know it's not super convenient for a lot of people because, you know, it's easier to just go to the grocery store and pick up whatever off the shelf, but, uh, there's reasons why you, that's maybe not the safest thing for your family. Again, the biggest one being the glyphosate issue, because yeah, that's going to mess you up on the quantum level, uh, circadian level. It's not going to be most of the time local, um, so it's a kind of a confusing signal for the body to have to deal with. And um, I don't know, it was, easy, it was easier when I was doing carnivore to to avoid the glyphosate. <laughs> but at a certain point, my hormones and my thyroid were like, mm, we need we need uh, some we need some some seasonal produce added into the mix here. So yeah, I think that's important for us to talk about how to yeah, go about getting that and doing that right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because, um, from, from a more like from a food dogma or a diet dogma, which we don't have, 
but you'll never hear us say you must be carnivore or you mm-hmm. must be keto or you must be vegan. Like we don't, we don't exist mm-hmm. in those kind of dogmas because mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. when you understand food, when you understand circadian rhythm, mm-hmm. you understand that food has a cycle in your environment as well, right? Mm-hmm. In the same way that I have a light, dark cycle and a seasonal cycle, so do, so do the plants in mm-hmm. my environment. And Mm -hmm. so when we're talking about really local circadian, we're talking about the produce, the plants, Mm -hmm. the fruits and the vegetables that are growing in our our particular location. These, let's let's talk about this first, right? Mm -hmm. Because plants grow and build carbohydrates based on a process called photosynthesis. Yes. And so they capture light. It splits a water molecule, right? I love, I love that. I love anytime water's involved. And it creates this cascade that ultimately ends up in the production of glucose. And that helps these plants grow, right? And, and, and get bigger, grow fruits, things like that. Now, the ability of a plant to do this depends on if the correct amount and intensity of some of, of certain wavelength ranges of sunlight are present in their environment. Meaning I could plant. I could, I could plant a bunch like cucumbers. It's very hard to be a bad cucumber grower in Michigan, right? Mm -hmm. Cucumbers love Michigan. It's super easy, right? They just grow like crazy in the correct time. When you plant Mm -hmm. them in the correct time, when the light is available for them, I could grow, try to grow as many cucumbers as I want in the middle of winter. It's not going to happen. Right. And so like that, I think that's a very obvious statement. And mm-hmm. so that's because the cucumber itself is waiting, not just for the correct temperature, but for, for the correct, like, yeah, the correct ultra, the correct, the correct UV. wavelength frequencies. And some of it's mm-hmm. actually in like the, the blue violet range. Some of it's even mm-hmm. in the red orange spectrum, but it has to be mm-hmm. the right amount, intensity and balance mm-hmm. in order to do that. And so if it's, if those wavelengths aren't there of the correct intensity, the plant won't grow. Right. And so when that, that means that when I then I get the opportunity to eat that glucose from that plant. And I take that glucose or fructose, right? And I take it and then I digest it. And in the electrons that have have made up the chemicals of that molecule, the electrons get sent, specifically that are carried on hydrogen, get sent to my mitochondrial electron transport chain, where Mm -hmm. the electrons go into into the electron transport chain. And then the protons, these naked hydrogens, go into the inner membrane space. Now we know that electrons from carbohydrates are more likely to enter at cytochrome one One. or step one of the electron transport chain. Whereas electrons from fat sources are more likely to enter at step two, right? Of the electron transport chain. And so that in and of itself is like, that's in and of itself is information for a mitochondria, right? right? Right. Where are we inputting electrons? Is it a lot at cytochrome one or is it more at cytochrome two? Cytochrome two input would be more indicative of when we would have produce scarcity. So Mm -hmm. winter, right? Winter, early spring, that time. Whereas we have the UV receptors on cytochrome one, right? Yeah, that's F. Yeah, you have uh, NAD on cytochrome one and you've got the um, FAD on cytochrome two. They're two different sensors for sure, Mm -hmm. for sure. And so that's where you have to pay attention to like, there's the, the mitochondria are literally picking up on these different types of inputs and where the flow is going into. Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk a little bit something about electron leakage later on as well in this talk and how that's a, we need that at a certain time of year because it tells our body to prep for something. Mm -hmm. And so again, if we want to consume right now, I would want to consume chives and early spring onions and starting to get asparagus and things like that, right? The the local spring produce that I could I could have found or you know gathered in my environment have the correct light in the electrons to go to the mitochondria just to optimize mitochondrial health. Mm-hmm. Another seasonal circadian signal, the right amount of deuterium, right? Mm-hmm. Very low, frankly, in deuterium. Yeah. So that I'm not yeah. mess, messing up my mitochondrial electron transport chain in a time right. when I, I can't, I don't have adequate UV and light or infrared it. to sequester it. Yeah. Right. To deplete it. Right. So, so yeah, that's why we talk about eating seasonally and locally and not this dogmatic diet approach because w- someone in the tropics can eat uh, tropical produce all year round if it's available mm-hmm. to them in their mm-hmm. environment. Now there's typically a dry cycle, a dry period and a wet period. So there might be some growing variations yes. there that someone pays mm-hmm. attention to, but 
We, on the other hand, maybe where you live, you might have more tropical produce available, but I, I don't, right? It's just not something I can grow in my light environment. Mm -hmm. If Mm -hmm. I'm syncing all of these things up together, if I'm syncing my circadian rhythm with the light, I'm syncing my gut microbiome with the light, they're adapting accordingly. Yeah, the the gut microbiome shifts per season as well. I don't think people know that. Same thing with the thyroid hormones and it's all meant to change seasonally. And so- exactly. (laughs) <laughs> when people talk about increasing microbiome health, I'm like, you got to expose your belly to the sun. You got to go outside. You got to be circadian aligned. So, cause your mitochondria are going to impact this process, right? Yeah, totally. All that light signaling is being put, pulled into our body in so many different ways that's being mm-hmm. perceived and everything is trying to adapt and optimize based on that light input mm-hmm. and also based on the temperature input, a secondary signal, right? Mm-hmm. Secondary signal. And so that's why we say seasonal and local, right? Because mm-hmm. everything about gut function, both on a 24-hour clock basis of digestive health yes. and on a gut microbiome basis of seasonal and, and even daily variation, all of it is trying to optimize yep. us and prepare us for the types of produce that may be available to us in our environment. And so yep. if someone has a gut that doesn't digest fiber very well, it tells me something. It means that they're not syncing up their circadian signaling with the light dark of their local environment or their seasonal environment. And they're potentially eating fibers and things that their body wouldn't have the gut microbiome adapted to, right. to be able to digest accordingly. Right. So there's just little signals like that, that we want to pay attention to. And, you know, y- you, you and I have said this before, especially during our gut health episode. And I was reminded of this in a beautiful way this past weekend, but we both had debilitating digestive issues, like Mm -hmm. Mm debilitating. So this isn't coming from people who have just been able to eat whatever they wanted all the time, right? No. No. And so it literally, I know for a fact that it is the circadian light signaling. It's a trying to eat seasonal and local whenever possible Mm -hmm. that really has made a huge difference in truly completely healing my gut. Like I Mm -hmm. accidentally ate a ton of gluten, didn't know it on Sunday. And everyone in my family was like, oh, let's get, let's get the bill. Let's go home. We know Carrie's going to need some time. And I was like, no, I, I'm going to be okay. Right. I'm going to be okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I was mm-hmm. no ramifications. Now, I, That's like we said, me too. it's like, we, we eh. choose not to do it a ton, right? We don't yeah. do this. on. And I'm not trying to play with it and see no. what the limit is, but if it happens, it's not the end of the world. Right. Yes. We want people to be inspired by this. And I know mm-hmm. that it was not only the seasonal local eating, but a lot of the light on the skin made mm-hmm. a huge difference in order mm-hmm. to support this. So this is, it's not just something that it, we're talking lip service on, like this literally can be life-changing for your gut and all of the other ramifications we know that happen when we, when we sink our circadian and signaling as best as we can. Right. Exactly. And it's, it's multifaceted. So, it, and it takes a little bit of faith and just trying it out and seeing how you feel. Cause it's easy to kind of be skeptical about these things that Carrie and I talk about and pick it apart, but it's like, don't knock it till you really try it. Cause we've, I know we've had multiple people in both of our communities that have healed their gut and they're able to get to this place where they're resilient. And I think that's what we really want for people is that they're able to tap into their intuition and they're able to be resilient. And I think that part of being able, and I know we've talked about this in the show multiple times, being able to get back to intuition and be able to quote unquote, trust your gut is heavily reliant on how synced you are to light, dark cycles, how connected you are to the earth and your local environment until we're so cut off from again, light, dark cycles. We're under these artificial lights and like what I am right now, obviously, but I will, when I'm done with this, go outside, get natural sunlight, put my feet on the earth, you know, like I know what to do um, to counteract this, but some people are environments like I'm in like all day long. And that's horrible for your gut. It's horrible for your microbiome. And it's horrible, I think, for your intuition and your resiliency as well. Yeah, totally. I think the re- I think resilience is absolutely the word because the re- and the, the resilience we've I've noticed comes multifold, right? And mm-hmm. but and I want to highlight though you said trust in this process because mm-hmm. my gut didn't heal overnight, right? Mm-hmm. I started to mm-hmm. feel better pretty darn quickly compared to all the other things I had tried. But it really was probably the 18 months to 2 year mark of yes. consistently doing this that my gut truly healed. 
Yeah. And so, and that, that was, that was not, it, it was something that I, I was willing, I was willing to go gluten-free, strict gluten-free the rest of my mm-hmm. life. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cause of how poorly I felt with that, that I didn't even test it out. And so you just, just know that this is something where we, it, it's not about, uh, you know, you're not necessarily going to notice a big bang for your buck in a four week window of time. Right. right. That's what people are not willing to sometimes just keep with it. Now yeah. I know we have people that have kept with it in your community and my community as well. And now they're, yes. You know, I've got people that have been in my group for, you know, three plus years now, and they kind of counsel the the new yeah, people yeah. before like I can even get to them. They're like, you got to be patient. You got to be consistent. You got to keep doing this stuff and it will eventually pay off. But we're so entrained to have a quick fix and to be, you know, I want to be done in six weeks. I need results immediately. And it's like with this type of thing, it's sometimes going to take some time, especially if you have your whole life of dysregulation um, in multiple facets, especially growing up the way I did with like pop tarts and lean cuisine and microwave meals and Oreo I cookies, mean, Oreo and cookies. Chinos and Doritos. Dorito. What, to, what, what were those pizza rolls? Tostinos, pizza Tostinos, rolls. Pizza, oh. Yes. Played, played of them after school, right? Just I lived on those in the lean pizzas for so many years. Like I thought I was doing like a healthy thing. I'm oh like, yeah. I went through a whole lean cuisine phase too. <laughs> spinach, white Alfredo pizza. I think I ate that thing like daily for- I did too. God it came, it came with, like you had to heat it up on top of the box. Yeah, right? you, to, <laughs> you fold the box yes, and then put yes. it in the microwave and then you slice it up with all these. Oh Yeah. That was that. And I <laughs> Oh my gosh. Yeah. I forgot about that. That was my that was my transition into healthy. Yeah. <laughs> the lean cuisines. <laughs> yeah. And that's so funny coming from like you and I come from like a fitness background as well, you know, oh, in yeah. terms of like it's easy to get suckered into marketing. It's okay. So wild. <laughs> and you know, and just talking about that fitness background, when I started to be a yoga teacher, a lot of people know this about me from when they if they've been around since I did carnivore. When I started teaching yoga and being heavily involved in the yoga community, it was all like beans and nuts and seeds and greens and salads and raw vegetables all the time, all the time, all the time. And my gut went to hell in a handbasket. Like literally, I remember being in yoga teacher training and having my like raw kale salad and my mung beans, um, sprouted mung beans, which, you know, those, if you're doing it at a seasonally appropriate time of the year and it's great, man. in, you know, the amounts you're supposed to be eating them great, but you're not really supposed to be doing it like the way I was in the middle of the winter time. And I would eat these, this food that I thought was supposed to be the most healthy yogic food. And I would be in teacher training and my gut would be so bloated. I would look like I was pregnant. I was just horrible gas. I'd be so embarrassed. Like I'd have to like leave the training sessions to go outside and pass gas. I'm like, something's not, something's not right about this whole thing. I think my body's telling me something. Yeah. And it's like, do, are we never, ever supposed to eat beans again? Are we never, ever supposed to eat kale again? Because I think that's what happens in the carnivore world is like anti-nutrients and you can't eat lectins and you can't eat then you follow Dr. Gundry and all. And it's, it's back like, to resilience there and adjusting your gut microbiome to the seasons. And if you're this. not throwing like five cups of kale into a blender and trying to drink it every day, it's probably okay to have some kale and, you know, if, if in doubt, cook it down. Um, but Deep yeah, all local makes yeah. a huge, huge difference. Right. And it's only going to be available for certain times exactly. of the year, like the spinach, because people are so freaked out about the oxalates and this, that, and the other, and the anti-nutrients. If you cook it, if you eat it when it's seasonally appropriate in ancestral amounts, so you're not eating like you're not going to have this huge bounty of it just to eat like bowls and bowls and bowls of it all day. And well, like you said, spinach and... in your smoothie, two cups of spinach or three cups of spinach in your smoothie every morning type situation. Well, I know that's wonder why your thyroid antibodies are through the roof when you're trying to follow these types of diets, you know, it's like yeah. your body's like, what are we doing here? What's going on? What, what time of year is it? Where am I living? It just doesn't make any sense. And so mm-hmm. when we, cause I, I know we get, the, I'm going to get the question about what about anti-nutrients? What about, um, you know, all these different things that are going to block nutrient absorption? What do we do? And it's like, 
eat in seasonal amounts. It when in doubt, cook it down. Um, it's and- not, it's not a huge issue when you heal All your rules. gut with your right. circadian practices and eat in a circadian appropriate way. Right. Like you said, it's just not a big issue. Your body adapts right. accordingly. So much of the information that's out there, I hate to say this because it sounds like we're repeating ourselves up, but so much of the research and or just clinical experience for, from some very beautiful clinicians who I think are trying to really do well for their patient populations are not done in the framework of having a circadian rhythm. Oh, It matters if you're looking at gut health, healing a gut, making sure the microbiome is adapted to digest the pro- the, uh, the proteins and the fibers accordingly. Yes. Like it's just, to me, it's, it's very hard. It's not, it's not an apples to apples comparison in any right. capacity. Right. And so, and so it's, it's okay. Like as much as we, as much as people are like, oh no, anti-nutrients, well, I mean, if when if if you have fear about something, number one, if you have fear about something, oh, avoid it. You're right. Your fear Don't is it. way it's worse than the actual than thing. the actual lectin or or right. phytic acid. And then if you if you don't have fear about it, but you just want to do a little bit of mitigation, soak your nuts and seeds, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then cook your veggies, lightly cook your mm-hmm. veggies, and uh, mm-hmm. and then chew the heck out of your food. Diet, let your mm-hmm. body digest it. Eat your meal in a place of gratitude, away from multitasking a lot can go into place to optimize your digestive process that doesn't ha- that doesn't involve fear of right. the foods that we're putting in our bodies right. i can literally i can eat anything sarah i can eat anything yeah. i me mean too. You know? <laughs> me too and i did carnivore for two years because i couldn't like and then i got so bought into this idea that the plants were poison and they were trying to kill me And I just, that made things even worse. You know, it was like, oh my gosh, I just, and I'm not saying that uh, elimination diets don't have a time and a place because I think they do. And I still use them with clients and I still recommend them to people for certain situations and for, for short periods of time um, to give your body a break and time to rest and time to heal and therapeutic fasting and all of that absolutely has a time and a place, but we're, we are not meant to be in a famine 365 days a year. That's the simple right. truth of it. We are not meant to fast all the time. We're not meant to carnivore all the time. We're not meant to be in ketosis all the time. Or uh, a surplus, frankly, or a surplus, all the time right? either. Because mm-hmm. most people, you know, I have a very strange kind of an following because a lot of people followed me because I was in carnivore. But this is like very small percentage of people. Most percentage of people are in like a surplus all the time and living like it's summer all the time. Yes. And that's a bigger problem. You know, I'm I'm putting together my leptin master plan course, which is more for practitioners and like looking at leptin in a kind of an advanced framework. But one of the things I was pulling studies and I was talking, I did a whole module on metabolic flexibility, the importance of for hormones, thyroid, all that stuff. When you look at the literature, which as you kind of alluded to, literature is very flawed because it's done under blue light and it's never done circadian aligned. And it's like, okay, cool, whatever. (laughs) You're, You're missing a lot of the equation here. But when you really look at metabolic flexibility and inflexibility, it's much more of an issue for somebody to always live in a summer metabolism than it is for somebody who has been in a winter metabolism. I can fix a winter metabolism person way faster than I can fix a summer metabolism person, if that makes sense. It does because low lep- the winter metabolism is low leptin scarcity. Mm-hmm. You can give the body nourishment and right. a feeling of safe space. Signals and get it moving in the right direction. What you're right. The vast majority of people are very bad sugar burners, right? They're they, stuck in that. Yeah. They're storing. And they can't burn fat for fuel. They can't tap mm-hmm. into their stored body fat and pull that as an energy source. Mm-hmm. Their yep. body's like, huh, what? How do I do that? Yep, <laughs> you know? exactly, exactly. And so, no, you're absolutely right. So for the vast majority of people, we're, we are overfed, mm-hmm. undernourished mm-hmm. in perpetual summer mm-hmm. is basically what's happening. And so yep. when we're talking about shifting to seasonal and local, um, and it it doesn't have to be ex, it it doesn't have to be an extreme right. thing in any capacity. And I think right. some people who do tend towards like maybe this was you at one point, Sarah. I don't know, but like it's like it's like you said, all or, I'm hearing all or nothing, right? Mm-hmm. It's like mm-hmm. right. It's like it has to be perfect, all or nothing. It's like wait, there's some parameters we're working within, you know, and mm-hmm. we want you to understand this aspect of seasonal and local and the importance of it. 
but mm-hmm. it, it doesn't, it, but it, it shifts and changes throughout the year. It's not mm-hmm. an all or nothing thing, right? I think it gives a lot more understanding of the nuances between how our body is intimately connected to mother nature through the seasonal signaling of light and temperature changes that our body can right. adapt to. And if somebody, you know, just talking about the seasonal thing, like if somebody lives in the tropics, but they're very, very leptin resistant, they shouldn't be eating a lot of the tropical fruit, even if it's growing right outside their door, they just shouldn't be because they're very poor, you know, at burning fat for fuel. You know, they're, they've messed up that signaling. They have uh, mitochondria that are inefficient. And so, yeah, a period of some scarcity for that person to train the body, how to burn fat for fuel would be helpful. So there's always context when we talk about food and seasonal local eating, uh, you got to look at your level of leptin resistance in the, in those conversation as well in seasonality, in local food, like if you're like very, very leptin resistant and your body doesn't know how to burn fat for fuel, you shouldn't be going to eat bananas all day and picking them, even if they're off a tree in your yard. It's just, right. Yeah, (laughs) it's true. No, absolutely true. Absolutely true. Well, you know, there, there is something fascinating too, because our availability of fructose in particular, fructose is an interesting signal, seasonal signal, Mm -hmm. right? Because fructose is a fruit sugar that's found Mm -hmm. in in fruit, right? But Mm -hmm. our availability of fructose is astronomically greater in the, Mm -hmm. for the majority of us than it ever would have been. Right. In nature. Absolutely. Right. You know, I mean, for example, I could get a jar of honey right Mm -hmm. now at any moment in time and Mm -hmm. consume it. And honey has some great properties. I Mm -hmm. love good old Manuka honey for some certain, Mm -hmm. for certain reasons, right? Honey has some amazing properties to it, but I tell people this is, this was a college lecture I used to teach. It was like, what, how would, what effort would you have had to put in to get, to get that a amount of honey? jar of honey or that yeah. amount of agave? How many cactuses would you have to poke your fingers on and find mm-hmm. in order to get that amount of agave or the, or the apples. Now I tell this story oh, of like my is. grandma's apple, like her apple tree where so it was like, small. right. And they were, they were hard. They hurt your jaw. They're bitter, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. as opposed to like these apples that take two hands right, right. to eat these days. Right. And so like, it's Our availability natural. is not, it's just not natural, right? So mm-hmm. fructose is meant to be a seasonal signal because when mm-hmm. are the most fructose rich plants available? When the UV index is high. The harvest season, right? After all yeah. of this beautiful UV yeah. light in, that yeah. has been able to help grow those plants, we get the harvest, this abundance of fructose. Why does that abundance of fructose precede winter? Is because fat enough before winter, right? Exactly. It makes no. a transient insulin resistant right. state, which is not a bad thing. We do right. need to be able to have a, a shift in metabolic function transiently during the fall in mm-hmm. order to signal, oh, there is going to be a period scarcity. of scarcity because mm-hmm. if we didn't prep for the scarcity before the scarcity happened, we would have been screwed. Right. And so we, we have, these are seasonal signals we're con- continually tying in. I'm so you can imagine someone who's leptin resistant and eating a massive amount of fructose, even if it's technically available to them, we're just living in different times these days, mm-hmm. right? So we, mm-hmm. we are meant to have this transient fructose signaling as a means of prepping us for scarcity. And then the scarcity never comes. Exactly. Yeah. That's the, and, and most people gain a lot of weight during the winter. They don't understand that we're not really actually supposed to be gaining weight in the winter. If there's a time of year that you were supposed to gain weight, it's in the fall. Yeah. <laughs> and the winter, you burn it off, right? You you are dealing, you're burning through your own body fat stores and you're in a more scarce place with food. And so there's, yeah, there's a cycle and there's a season to all of that that gets, gets completely ignored and left out of the conversation. People gain weight in the winter because they're eating baked goods and cookies and staying indoors and they're under artificial lights and they never go outside. And it's like, they're never just get cold. Like, yeah. Never get cold. Yeah. Never, yeah. They can yeah. go to the grocery store and buy the giant apples in the middle of December, January and eat those. And it's not even and, that, that's not even what they're doing. This. And I was going to say, and in the grand scheme of things, I'd much rather someone buy a giant apple than, you know, we'll the candy the bar or ice like, cream or yeah. Yeah. If you're not having these like very hugely deuterium laden foods. Like Mm -hmm. you said, like the ice cream and the Kit Kats and candy bars and snack bars and protein bars and all that crap. It's very, very high in deuterium. Um, And it's nutrient poor. Right. That's the thing too. You're never going to optimize leptin signaling if you keep giving Mm -hmm. your body nutrient poor foods. The body's going to keep saying, feed me. You didn't give me anything that I can use. The mitochondria need minerals and the cofactors of these things to actually run efficiently. B vitamins, right, exactly. Yes, yes. So. and you can't get that through um, a 
a, a protein bar or any of that stuff. Like it's a candy bar, potato chips. <laughs> oh, and even like people, t- what about sourdough bread? And what, you know, I'm like, <laughs> there's nuance to all of that. Yeah. Listen, your yeah. ability to consume carbs year round depends very much on your leptin status and your mm-hmm. activity level. Exactly. Exactly. Some so. people are fine with it, but like if, if you're very leptin insensitive, you shouldn't be doing eating those foods. I don't think if um, you're super low, if you're super low in leptin, you may need to actually mm-hmm. eat them. So go mm-hmm. listen to our leptin talk too, that we did on yeah. this. If you're interested in this stuff, because yep. it sounds like, it sounds like there's a lot of nuance and there is right. There That's is. the thing about nutrition. It's not just cut and dry. Like everyone must eat this. This is why and- I don't give meal plans because what are you going to do for number one? What are you going to do when the meal plan is over? Like, how are you going to eat? How are you going to learn about these things? I want to teach someone these principles that you and I are talking about. I want to teach someone of like, what kind of foods might be inappropriate for elevated leptin? What be might be more ideal for low leptin? You know, how do you know someone is one or the other? And how do you cycle through things seasonally? Because there is never going to be a meal plan that's the same in the summer as it is in the winter, as it is for high leptin as for low leptin. And even when you get into low leptin, you've got low leptin underweight, normal weight and low leptin overweight. Mm -hmm. So my low leptin overweight, I'm still not going to give them sourdough bread. Sorry. (laughs) Like you're just so it's like all, I keep saying this in my leptin practitioner courses, like always look at the individual. Here are the questions to ask. Here are the parameters to consider. And then you make the decisions based on that. And it's so that it's not like popular or easy because you have to always be looking at these other things. Um, But on the whole, when we're looking at food, I think that there's ideal, there's like gold standard, which is like local seasonal. And then there's like, okay, because I know we'll get the question. What about greenhouse grown foods? I say it's better than a freaking bag of Doritos. Okay. <laughs> like, I'm, percent. I'm it- not going to stress out or you ate some kale out of a greenhouse or you went to the store and you bought pop tarts and ate those. Like I'd rather you have the greenhouse food than the pop tarts. Like your body knows a lot better of what to do with it. <laughs> yeah. That, well, and there's nutrients. So right. I mean, right. Even though people are going to say there's anti-nutrients, but like the thing is, is that if you have an intact circadian rhythm mm-hmm. with your light environment, that's the primary thing your body is looking to. That's what, that is what your microbiome is adapting to, right? All that stuff. And like you said, have I ever seen someone eat excessive greenhouse bell peppers to completely throw, you know, their, their circadian signaling and their gut off? No, I haven't. However, you have to make note of when we talk about eating like not seasonal, where we really are talking a ton about the the really fructose rich foods. Yes, the, the high deuterium foods. Deuterium. High deuterium. When you think deuterium, think sugar. Like yeah, on the most part, think sugar. Yeah, yeah. The, so the the most sugary tropical produce that you could find, and processed foods like b- bar none we are saying processed foods across the board is garbage right, right we're, we're right. never su- suggesting processed foods in any mm-hmm. capacity and and but that- on the same token <laughs> just to play devil's advocate if you're leptin sensitive if you have maximized your resiliency and you eat a little bit of processed food it doesn't ruin your life exactly and you can- that's totally true so just to throw that in there so we're not like no. you know food like you know we're not perfectionists. No, <laughs> not in any way, but I don't share what I eat in a day or any of that stuff because it's going to be different. I live in the 33rd latitude, you know, um, I'm very sure. leptin sensitive. I'm, I'm leaner than I've ever been in my whole life. And so what I eat and what my body can handle and deal with is not going to be what the majority of people can eat, handle and deal with, Same. you know, and they don't live where I live. So it's just, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's so many factors, but right, going back to the deuterium conversation, yeah, you have to take that into account, and it's mostly going to be those higher sugar foods. So if you're eating greens and vegetables and like Brussels sprouts, things like that that are grown in a green, greenhouse, I'm much less concerned about it than if you're eating um, bananas or the higher sugar foods grown in a greenhouse. So there's mm-hmm. context with the greenhouse food also, right? Yeah, sure, sure. Exactly, exactly. 
So I'm, I'll tell the, I'll tell everyone how I try to do lay this out right in in my life right. So starting now, it would be a great time. So we're this we're recording this at the beginning of April, right? Mm-hmm. And so starting now is a great time to find what's called a CSA. Mm-hmm. Community supported agriculture, right? So you can find a CSA box. There's farms at my farmer's barn. There's so many farms. And I don't live in a, a huge city by any capacity, right? But there are so many farms that harvest their weekly produce, put it in a box, you mm-hmm. pick up the dang box at some location, and that's the produce you use, right? Yeah. Now I am I'm particular because I know the farms that have organic and regenerative growing practices versus the farms that just spray spray up yeah. the wall. So, so I'm particular about that, but it's a great way to get started with this because then you can start to see the seasonal changes in terms of mm-hmm. what's available to you. That week. It's yeah. in your box for that week. Exactly. And then you can supplement that, right? Um, you can buy some eggs, you can buy your meats, you can get your fish, you know, um, mm-hmm. if you want, so- and if you want something else, fine. Right. But it's a great way just to start to introduce this concept. Mm-hmm. We have a beautiful company, you know, a beautiful farm um, and that that puts these together, these boxes. They literally, you might have this, someone might have this in your area. They literally pull together from multiple farms, right? A, a box and you can pick and choose on a weekly basis. It's fabulous, right? So, and again, mm-hmm. not a huge community, just people who understand the importance of, of eating seasonally and locally and supporting farms that are seasonal mm-hmm. and local, right? That That's a very mm-hmm. important um, thing that we have, that we have to support as well. Yeah. And then go to a farmer's market, mm-hmm. start to get to know the small regenerative farms. They're not going to say certified organic. It costs mm-hmm. too much money mm-hmm. for these small farms to maintain certified organic, right? So go and talk to the people and see what they're putting out there. So I love the farms where right now I'm going to start to see these, these um, spring onions and things like that, right? Mm-hmm. Where it's just like, okay, these, these clearly are the, the, the places that are small. They're growing small amounts. They're, they're, they say they're using regenerative practices. You can talk to them about what they're using. Sometimes they'll use like literally mushroom runoff water. Right. To, right. To, to, to fertilize. So just start to have conversations with these farmers. And then, you know, a couple of your go to venues at a farmer's market where you can say, OK, I'm going to get I'm going to pick up the produce that they have. It's a thousand times cheaper. Mm-hmm. I could literally get a thing of onions that is this big for two dollars. Right. Organically mm-hmm. grown onions. That'll last me a long time. Right. For two dollars, mm-hmm. as opposed to going to the to the grocery store and picking stuff up like that. Right. So. It's if you start to understand how that, like, if you can find these places and build this into your routine, make it a fun family event, right? Mm-hmm. You know, to get when we got my kids started, it there was always these people who made like these, um, like uh, organic fruit pressed popsicles. Oh, um, yeah. My kids are left insensitive, whatever, right? It's like yeah. get them to the farmer's market, get them interacting with the local, understanding where food comes from. Yeah, um, what it takes to grow it, you know, and so so it's like it's a really great thing to get to start to start doing as a family, right? Yeah, and then give them a little a little treat uh, as well. With it, we also used to play at the park nearby too. They're a little older now, but um, but yeah, you know, just start to think about this. A lot of people have yeah. never really even reached out and and looked at what farms are available. Right. And if you don't have a farmers market or there's not farms available like this, then then. Go to some, there, there's a lot of websites that literally have what's what's in season. Mm-hmm. For example, Michigan State University is responsible for a farmer's calendar. Mm-hmm. What gets planted, what can be harvested, what's available. And so find that seasonal produce calendar. And then mm-hmm. you'll start to see, oh, okay, so this is where I get the spring greens and the onions yeah. and the rhubarb versus, oh, wow, look at the apples, the plums, the peaches, the, right? You start to see the shifts. And then if you can't get them from a local farm, just start to think about, okay, these are our lower deuterium. I'm going to eat these now. Yes. And then you just get them from your regular grocery store. Yep. You just are wrapping your brain around this aspect of concept lo- exactly yes. as best as you can. Yeah. Cause there's not, everyone's going to have the time or the energy to go out. I have a farm that will deliver here to my house, which is pretty amazing. Nice. Mm-hmm. Um, they'll just bring the box to you every single week and get your milk, eggs, meat, produce, all that stuff. You just order it online and they'll deliver it on Friday, but, um, not everyone can get out to the farm and do that kind of thing. So I think just having an awareness of, Hey, it's, um, October, you know, or it's December. I shouldn't be going out and getting a bunch of fruit, you know, to eat necessarily. Uh, I, it's not not really a seasonally appropriate time for me to do that. If I want to make some of the more like winter stews and use some green vegetables to put into my stews to add more minerals and things like that, then 
If you cook them down, then that's a little bit more appropriate because those are lower in deuterium. So I always like to bring deuterium into the conversation because, and just to keep it very simple, high sugar, high deuterium, processed food, higher deuterium. Summertime, more appropriate because your body has the ability due to the UV light to deplete deuterium and you can sweat more in the summer. Wintertime, you're not getting that strong UV light. And so your mitochondria are less able to get rid of that deuterium and it's more likely to sequester it and to slow down mitochondrial function. And so thinking of it in that framework, and I'm one of the few people that will say, and I know I'll probably get slapped for saying this, but um, foods that are a little bit more okay to eat, even though they're not necessarily seasonally appropriate or like the higher fat foods and the low, like the greens, you know, so like coconut milk, avocado, I think not ideal to eat in the winter, but less of an issue than eat than drinking coconut water and eating tropical fruit. I think less of an issue. So there's always, like I said, gold standard, good, Mm, not so good, right? I, and for people whose digestive tracts are able to handle it, because this is this is a continuum, right, of healing. I also find the same thing with like nuts and seeds, mm-hmm. right? Well oh, sourced, yeah. right? Well sourced. I well feel like sourced. if you're consuming an appropriate amount, which is not like you know a big old salad bowl full of it, right? We're talking right. about maybe a little handful of these. That also can go. That can also be something that goes outside of seasonal and local, right? And doesn't have as big of an impact. And small amounts, because mm-hmm. we would never, we were never going to have like enough cashews available to put them into a blender, grind them up, and make cashew nut butter, or almond butter, or these like almond flour tortilla things. Like that never would have happened. <laughs> ancestrally it just never would have worked and so fascinating yeah funny yeah but we've just got we can mass produce things now and there's great conveniences to modern life but we have to ask like what's the price that we're paying with our health with our digestive system with our gut and i just i know you because you just came out with a really really amazing uh gut health master class so it's a huge issue that people are dealing with is the gut problems right it is. It absolutely has been. Unfortunately, very few people are talking about what I think is the most important. So everyone wants to talk about supplements and then mm-hmm. diet, right? right? And those can play a role. They can help. But like my whole focus is light. It's it's on something called cephalic phase digestion. Yes. No one knows about this or they don't talk about it. Talk no about one it. talks about like the how we bre- how we bread out the bitter taste in all of the food that we eat. And so we're not activating bitter receptors. We've got bitter receptors everywhere in our body. Mm -hmm. We need that continuous bitter sensation. It's a, it can be a hormetic response as well, right? Bitter, Mm -hmm. right? But it's Mm -hmm. an important thing to have that um, regular production. Cause if we taste bitter, the, the, the stomach all of a sudden says, Oh, something might be coming in that I have to really process quickly and get rid of. Let me make enough stomach acid. Let me make enough enzymes and things. And so we just, we don't think of stuff like that in any capacity. We don't. I was, it's so funny you mentioned that because I was, I'm doing my leptin and cold therapy like this week for my leptin masterclass, the, the practitioner level course. And I was reading through Cruz's lep, uh, leptin and cold RX. And that's one of the things that he said is to um, have something bitter before you do cold therapy. And Interesting. Like, yeah. And that's so funny you bring that up because that's kind of basically what he was explaining is that how it actually can enhance doing a cold plunge mm-hmm. is having something bitter beforehand. I'm like, very genius. You know, it's something people never really understand digestion and food to that level, right? Yeah, exactly. And the, the application isn't hard, right? Mm-hmm. I find mm-hmm. I find the recommendation of chewing your food 30 times mm-hmm. to be way more impactful mm-hmm. than like a really strict diet or yeah. light yeah. on the stomach, way more impactful right, than things like that. Because these are, these are, these are things we're designed to naturally do, right? Yep. We're yep. not meant like, I, and I'm guilty. I was the one who literally was chewing my food five times before I swallowed mm-hmm. it. And no wonder my stomach couldn't digest anything. Right. right. And I was eating on the go, you know, this in the fitness mm-hmm. world, it's like really quickly in between classes, I'm just going to really quickly shove some stuff in my mouth mm-hmm. really fast. Mm-hmm. So I never came down from a very sympathetic nervous system state yeah. in any capacity. I was always multitasking with my meals, yeah. you know? So I think some, I think little things can, can make a big difference to optimize yeah. gut health and digestion that, that literally deals zero with the foods that we eat. Exactly. Exactly. What else are we missing? Anything that you can think of? 
No, I just really encourage people to get out there and explore what's available to them. I think that's the biggest barrier. Just learn, right? Just learn. Mm -hmm. And then you'll start to really see, and then you can choose. Well, today I want to eat nachos. Fine. Right. Go ahead. Right. There's that, but it's just, I find that that knowledge base really keeps me grounded Mm -hmm. in, in, in what I know of as what feels optimum to me. And Mm -hmm. then if I choose to deviate from that, I choose to deviate that from that, from it for for like in a transient moment of time, but then other, but then otherwise it's just like, yes, this is why I'm really starting to crave salads. Mm -hmm. This is, and then in the winter, this is why I'm really, I really want those meat and meaty stews, right? Like Mm -hmm. you just start to see these seasonal shifts. You start to crave I start to crave fruit at a certain time. Mm-hmm. And, I, and if I do happen to crave fruit, because I don't crave, we've talked about this, I don't crave fruit in the winter. But mm-hmm. if all of a sudden I'm at the grocery store and mango looks really good, I buy the mango because there must be a nutrient in the mango that my body is oh, asking yes. for. Like, you know, and so it's just yeah. fun to see and feel these shifts and changes mm-hmm. that happen when you become more aware and adapt yeah. your, your nutrition to your local seasonal environment. Exactly. And then again, you know, and taking into account what's going on in your body. Like when I was pregnant, everyone's like, how did you stay on the protocol when you were pregnant? And I'm like, I did not stay. I listened to my body. And I think I went into pregnancy. Most people have a potassium deficiency but I think because of my years of low carb and carnivore dieting, like I really was like lacking potassium and first trimester, I hadn't had a potato in years, but I was like potato, tomato, potato, tomato. Like it was all I could think about. And so I, I was literally that woman taking tomatoes and dipping them into ketchup and eating them. Like my, my first trimester, but I, I was like, cravings. Those are like, fun. you know Those what? I'm not really going to worry about this. Cause obviously there's something, there's a mineral, uh, or there's a, a vitamin that my body needs. My mitochondria needs to be building this amazing baby. And now he's this amazing little 18 month old talking, walking yeah. like miracle. And I'm like, yeah, I just, I don't regret eating potatoes or tomatoes or any of that crap. Cause I was listening to that signal of like what my sure. body needed. So sometimes you will get like, once you become in tune, cause Carrie is very, you know, Carrie's really in tune with her surroundings. She's very in tune with light, dark cycles. So if she's walking through the grocery store in December and her body says you need a mango, she's going to listen to it. But like, if you're, you know, not in tune with these things and your body says you need to go to McDonald's, then it's probably not a good. I've a, never had that, right? That's the thing neither. too. No. Your body, your body knows what feels nourishing to mm-hmm. it and what it might need versus mm-hmm. once, once you've gone through this process. And again, it, t- it takes a long time. It does, mm-hmm. but like I have, I, even, even when we were driving and like my kids, my husband and kids, like the only thing in sight was a McDonald's. I didn't get a darn thing. Cause I'm like, there's it's no not appealing just, to me. It, no, it actually sounds nasty mm-hmm. to me. My body mm-hmm. just doesn't, the, it, re- it rejects. It's like, no, there's nothing in there. That sounds yeah, good. Rather just, fast, honestly. Exactly. Exactly. My own body fat. <laughs> totally. That's exactly what I did because it's like, yeah, yeah. A bunch of hangry, starving kids, probably not the best thing to feed them. You do what you can. Right. You know? Right. Um, exactly. But at the same time, I was, my body was just like, no, I can, I can go without. Thank you. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So hopefully the moral of today's episode is learn. You don't have to be perfect, right? But just be willing to learn and and look at nutrition, food, all these things kind of through a different lens. Yes. And I find it to be very freeing. I find it to be very empowering and very, very freeing. And, and it's it's a better way of looking at food rather than like, I'm keto. I'm vegan. I'm kind of like identifying yourself as a way of eating. Like you're hiding behind something like you're, I'm sorry to say it, like you're hiding behind uh, something big. Um, So that needs to be looked at. If you have to use your diet as like your whole personality, like that's a problem. (laughs) I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it really, yeah. I don't feel like there's ever an identity to this in any capacity. It's just, it feels like you're becoming one with nature. It just feels like a deeper connection to nature, which I always recommend. Like we, we've divorced ourselves so much from nature. Mm -hmm. So this is just another Mm -hmm. way that we can kind of get back in touch in this, in this way through our, through the lens of nutrition. I love it. I love it. All right. Well, this has been lots of fun and check out Carrie's gut health masterclass. If you're dealing with gut issues, I have a quantum nutrition course. If you want to learn more about this stuff too, and uh, see you on the next episode. 